The rise of the superbug. Antibiotics are becoming less and less effective against drug-resistant bacteria. Millions of people fall ill with one of these superbugs every year. It's estimated that about 700,000 people die from them annually. How are our actions helping these bacteria build up their resistance to antibiotics? And what can we do to reverse the trend? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. Imagine being sick with an infection that doctors can't treat. Well, that is the problem facing millions of people around the world who are being infected by so-called superbugs, bacteria that have become resistant to almost all of the antibiotics we currently use. It's feared that without radical new advances, the number of people dying from them could rise to 10 million people a year by 2050. Well, the British government has commissioned a review to look into the issue. This is what it's recommending. It says a wider use of existing vaccines as a preventative measure could have a significant impact. It also says we should reduce the number of antibiotics being used to slow the speed at which bacteria become resistant and save lives. One example is the vaccine for pneumococcus, a bacteria that causes bloodstream infections. It's already used in many parts of the world and could save the lives of 800,000 children under five years of age worldwide every year if used more widely. The report suggests more funding for long-term vaccine research and financial incentives for companies that develop them. It warns that all countries will be affected by the rise in superbug infections and calls on governments to work together on this issue. Well, earlier I spoke to Jim O'Neill, who's the chairman of the UK's review on antimicrobial resistance. And I started by asking him just how big a problem this superbug phenomenon really is. Well, potentially it's going to be a devastating problem. Uh, already today, uh, we estimate around 700,000 people uh, across the world uh, are dying from drug resistance uh, problems. Uh, if you speak about the world as a whole, in Europe and the US it's about 25,000 people in each place and not many people know because it's a number of different things. Uh, but why I say devastating is that 700,000, if we don't find solutions, uh, could become 10 million uh, 10 million a year by 2050. So clearly so the key a, a now is to find a solution. We, we couldn't even think of. Okay, clearly now we need to find so, a solution. What should the solution be? Where should the solution come from? So the, uh, the scale of the challenge is, is quite complex, hence why uh, I was asked to head up this review and, and why it's so stimulating as well as so important. Uh, because there's, it's multifaceted, but if I sort of break it down into what I'd call uh, a demand problem and a supply problem, uh, I think it helps to try and give some clarity. So on, on the supply problem, we, we have what economists would call a classic market failure problem, that uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, aren't feeling incentivized to try and research and then uh, succeed in going through the various stages of, of, of clinical trials to pay the money to, to find new drugs or new vaccines. Uh, it's estimated it costs them uh, anywhere up to one and a half billion dollars to do so. Uh, and that's even before they really know whether they're going to get the prices uh, uh, that they'd like to charge for them. And so you've got to find ways of either forcing them or in incentivizing them to change. And we're very involved in uh, providing ideas about that, which our final report will specify very clearly in May. Uh, and then on the, on the demand side, as you might call it, uh, we have to essentially re-educate all 7 billion plus of us all over the world uh, to stop thinking that using antibiotics uh, should be as casual as, as eating sweets. They are frequently uh, misprescribed, 
frequently taken for the wrong things and then when we do get them a lot of us uh, don't use the full uh, prescription in, in which case they're of no use anyhow so we have to change that radically and uh, we're suggesting and we've published on this already uh, that we need state-of-the-art diagnostics in many parts of the world if not all our medical practitioners still basically use a finger in the air as opposed to using what I sometimes call Google for doctors and, and modern technology to, to be more precise as to how they prescribe. Okay. Uh, and then with that in the report we're focusing on in this one is about boosting the, the potential role of vaccines to, present the need, sorry, to prevent uh, the need for a lot of antibiotics in the first place. So, Jim, you are saying that Big Pharma is not incentivized with saving lives. If that's the case, shouldn't this global problem be put into someone else's hand, someone who's willing and able? Well, I think uh, it requires uh, both of them to play their, their role. And in, in the reports we published uh, some time ago, we've raised ideas about how they may, they may both. And as we now move to our final reports, we're, we're increasingly... Uh, finalizing our thoughts on, on what they might both do and let me give you a bit of a flavor. We, we've estimated to get uh, the right kind of new drugs, not any old drugs, but the drugs that would work uh, would cost anywhere from 15 to 35 billion dollars over a 10-year period for the, for the precise uh, new drugs and anti, uh, for antibiotics and vaccines that we think would be appropriate. Uh, that, that is obviously a lot of money, although frankly, in the scale of, uh, of, of the cost that will happen to society if we don't do something about it, it's actually peanuts. Uh, it, we've estimated it will cost the world an accumulated hundred trillion dollars between now and 2050 if we don't find a solution. So and, and what about 15 new... to 35 billion dollars is small, but what, what about, what sorry, we are, sorry, can uh, I just uh, quickly ask you, what about new sure. antibiotics? I was quite surprised to learn that we haven't seen any new antibiotics for 25 years. Isn't it time to step up and create something new there? Well, this is, this is part of, uh, of the whole puzzle, and this is why the, the, the money is needed. And what, what the, the two choices that, that are there are either the, uh, the world's major governments, so perhaps through the G20, which essentially is the, the organization that brings together the governments that represent close to 90% of world GDP, they have to uh, collectively agree on, on paying this 15 to $35 billion uh, to essentially subsidize pharmaceutical companies, or uh, a, a very plausible alternative, which is controversial, but one we are pursuing, is that the pharmaceutical uh, industry itself has to collectively pay or something that I would describe as pay or play. Mm -hmm. So for those few pharma companies that are, are enlightened enough to know that this is important for them to commit resources to, they would get direct support uh, for only the successful production of new antibiotics and the money for that would come from a, a, a levy or a surcharge on pharmaceutical sales uh, from leading pharmaceutical companies all over the world. And that would uh, enable the financial cost to be found without it being directly borne by governments, which indirectly might come back to taxpayers, of course. All right, so away from the governments, away from the large pharmaceutical companies, what is it that the man and the woman on the street can do at the moment? Is there anything they can do to stop themselves from getting sick? So I think there is about three simple things that the, the man and the woman on the street can do. First of all, they can wash their hands uh, a lot more frequently, uh, particularly when they're uh, uh, using uh, shared facilities in, in, in public toilets. Uh, a lot of transmission can come through that, and that's a very simple thing that people can do. And one of the things we will recommend in our final report is the cost of a global awareness campaign to try and make people, especially in the emerging world, think uh, uh, and be aware of these issues. The second thing they can do is when they go to visit their medical practitioner, instead of just uh, uh, assuming uh, that they, that they are, are, are justified in getting an antibiotic for whatever illness it is they or their children have got, is actually asking their, their clinician or doctor as to are they sure that this requires an antibiotic, mm. uh, which itself can help uh, uh, take the pressure off uh, doctors from just 
uh, under the pressure they are, finding it so easy to just write a prescription uh, and, and, and then and get rid of them and move on to the next patient. And then the third thing, they, they, they can sh play their own role uh, through the food industry uh, of, of trying to put pressure uh, on food producers uh, to make sure they're trying to uh, incentivize the agricultural industry where there's a separate huge problem uh, of not feeding so many antibiotics to the animals to fatten up uh, uh, meat producing products in particular as, as the way the, the path has been going. Let's bring in the rest of our guests in Aberdeen, Hugh Pennington. Emeritus Professor of Bacteriology at the University of Aberdeen. Hugh is a specialist on bacteria typing. And in New Delhi, we have Shelley Batra, President of Operation ASHA, a health NGO. Shelley is a health specialist. A very warm welcome to both of you. Let me start off with you, Shelley Batra. Very frightening picture that's been painted there of the superbug. How worried are you and what are you seeing in India, first of all? Well, I think we are losing the fight against superbugs and I think superbugs are here to stay and unless we clean up our act now and accelerate momentum in the direction of ensuring adherence, we are in big trouble. There will be millions of deaths in the next decades unless we take care of this problem and address it now. Let me talk a little bit about India. Sure. Now there is a huge health infrastructure available. The problem is of access, and this problem is not for India alone. This is in all developing countries that there is lack of health access. So when there is no access, adherence to medication is going to be a big issue. Taking vaccinations regularly is going to be a very big issue. And all these will lead to drug resistance. With global travel, the bacteria travel all over the world. If there is a drug-resistant bacteria, this bacteria will not be contained by geographical barriers. The bacteria is everywhere. And this is how drug resistance spreads all over the world. Now, what we have to do is, number one, we have to address the issue of last mile delivery. Our last miles have to become stronger, more pervasive, deeper in disadvantaged areas. They must reach the unreached the hard to reach inaccessible patients in far off parts of the, of the country. And only then we can ensure adherence. Secondly, we must accept the fact that the governments cannot do the last mile delivery. And the NGOs have to step up their act. And we have to encourage public-private partnerships in order to ensure that the facility, the government infrastructure is accessible to the person living in the last mile, the poorest of the poor. Hugh Pennington. Another problem faced all in right. all the developing countries. Okay, let me bring in Hugh Pennington now. I mean, you look at this bacteria very close up, and I'm just wondering what you've learnt about it, how something so small can be so dangerous. Well, there are. Uh, there is a small number of bacteria which are dangerous. Most of them aren't, but there is a small number that are. And they do their damage in all sorts of different ways. And that's part of the problem that Jim O'Neill was talking about, mm -hmm. uh, that, that some specialise in going around hospitals, causing infections there and becoming drug resistant in hospitals. Uh, others are in the community. And, for example, you know, the, one of the commonest causes of infection, uh, infectious disease that causes death in the UK is pneumonia. And we have a vaccine against that. The problem is getting the vaccine to the right people. That bug is beginning to get resistant to antibiotics. Uh, and so there's a big challenge there. It can't just be um, sorted out by having a, a, a vaccine. We have to get the vaccine delivered to the right people. And even if we had a, a good vaccine, there are other types of this bug. The bug evolves and some will evolve to become resistant to the vaccine as well as to the antibiotics. So it, it's very much a, a problem, uh, a, a very multifaceted problem. 
And we have the same issues in, in the UK as, as, as in India in terms of getting access. We also have uh, problems in that people take antibiotics when they shouldn't. They don't take them properly. They're overprescribed. Um, and we, we also have um, you know, other, other issues with, with hospital acquired infections, which have sometimes traveled around the world. So it is an international problem. And um, it, it, it's a problem that requires resolution because we are running out of antibiotics. If I can comment on the idea of having new antibiotics, mm. yes, that's fine. And we have to incentivize the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies to develop them. It'd be very, it's very expensive. And uh, the problem is, well, there are two problems, really. One is that we've discovered all the easy uh, targets to hit with antibiotics already. So it's going to be more difficult than discovering antibiotics, uh, say, 30, 40 years ago. And then, of course, as soon as the bacteria meet these new antibiotics, some of them will become resistant as well. So we may just be putting off uh, the, 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 the problem for about another 20 years. So it is not an easy problem. It's going to be one that will be fighting, I think, pretty well forever. And possibly one bug at a time. So it seems, Shelley, that we have to tackle this possibly one bug at a time. And considering it's such a multifaceted problem, who do you think should be leading the charge here? A multifaceted problem needs a multi pronged approach. One person or one organization cannot do it alone. So it has to be governments, NGOs, multilateral, bilateral agencies. It has to be bacteriologists. It has to be the corporates and the farmers. And we have to fight the fight together, each person giving it his or her own contribution and each organization adding to the strength of this consortium. Then and only then we'll be able to fight the fight. I'm just wondering, in countries like India, these developing countries where there is a lot of poverty, a lot of people are affected by this, how incentivized are governments in spending money on superbugs? I mean, don't they have bigger, more pressing problems to worry about? Yes, the governments are no doubt focused now on superbugs and the problems. One big problem we have in India is tuberculosis. We have the biggest TB problem in India. Our numbers far exceed uh, those of second ranking China. And NDR TB, multi-drug resistant TB is here to stay. Now the government of India has tied up with a big pharma company to do a trial of a new drug that has been discovered for multi-drug resistant TB, Bidaquilin, and that will be tested for almost 800 patients in three metros. So I think the governments are beginning to realize what a big problem this is. At the same time, my concern is if a new drug is being used and there is no one to ensure adherence, to ensure the drug is being taken regularly, that drug will become useless again and millions of dollars of research money and funding and effort will go down the drain. And Hugh, I mean, so when you look I at what happened as far as the Ebola drugs, crisis, sorry, excuse me, jumping in here. I mean, people were, were pretty frightened of some of those governments who were involved. They didn't trust them. How big a problem is that and, and how much politics has to play when it comes to dealing with something like this? Politics in, uh, in antibiotics. Um, are very clearly intertwined and governments have to act. Um, the first example of a government acting in terms of making sure that uh, we used antibiotics properly was it was in the UK in 1947 that thanks to the influence of Alexander Fleming who discovered penicillin we brought in an act of parliament that penicillin could only be uh, prescribed by a doctor's prescription it couldn't be bought over the counter and unfortunately in many countries of the world you can still buy antibiotics over the counter so you know governments can't control them well they can control them if they choose to so there's a political issue here and of course politics comes into the funding the fund of a health service, uh, delivery of, of, of um, vaccines is a very political issue because sometimes people resist uh, vaccines being, being given to their children and so on. And that's been a big problem in the UK, for example. So there are all sorts of issues here which, which uh, really are political at the end of the day. Government money, of course, is absolutely crucial. And the government influence on how we use antibiotics is also important. And of course, you mentioned trust, and there has to be trust there. There has to be trust between, for example, the professionals, you know, the health professionals, and, and the patients and the communities at large, who, so that we can get those messages across. Don't go and 
buy antibiotics over the counter if you think they're going to do you good. Uh, and and for, for doctors, don't prescribe antibiotics for a sore throat because it's not going to do any good because the cause of a sore throat is usually a virus which is not affected by antibiotics. So there are all sorts of public messages that can be got out and governments clearly have an enormous role to play in making sure that those messages are, uh, are got across. But I agree absolutely. This is a, a, a has to be a multi-pronged attack against these bugs. These bugs don't have any brains, but they're very clever. Yeah. Um, Shelia, it's frustrating considering that some of this is a man-made problem, isn't it? I mean, we're in a catch-22 here, aren't we? We you know, try to get rid of antibiotics, but animals are given antibiotics. That makes it resistant in human beings. So how do you stop the cycle? I think we humans are responsible for, a, for most of the superbug problem. And I will tell you the many ways in which we have been responsible. Number one, there is, a, there is a culture of quacks all over the country, the unlicensed practitioners. And these are the ones who are writing indiscriminate, irregular prescriptions, giving all kinds of antibiotics without any thought, any scientific reason behind it. And, and then, when these people give, you know, for, for tuberculosis, they'll give a prescription, one steroid and one rifampicin. So obviously there's going to be drug resistance and there will be, rifampicin will become useless. So there has to be someone, and, and another thing is that we have pharmacies, the chemist shops who are selling drugs, antibiotics without a prescription. So our regulations have to become stronger and we have to implement regulation. It's not enough for the government to say that there can be no uh, selling of antibiotics without a prescription. How are you ensuring that this is not done? There are parts of the country where even chemists are just prescribing indiscriminately. And that is what leads to drug, drug uh, resistance. Uh, Hugh, I'm just wondering when, when what we're looking a, at in the next in 10 the years or so. You know, the predictions are, are pretty ominous of how many people can die in a year. But I mean, so, I mean, f from a society, we've got, if you look at the Zika virus, babies born with deformed heads. I mean, what is your prediction going forward if we don't tackle this and tackle this now? Well, we are tackling it. Uh, I'm more effectively optimistic rather, rather. in the sense that we have won some battles already. We have won some battles already. Uh, MRSA, which is a worldwide problem, which is a bug that spreads in hospitals, mm. which by definition is antibiotic resistant. We've managed not to get rid of it, but to control it by having much better um, infection controls in hospitals. Really, it's about hand washing again. We come back to hand washing, absolutely crucial. And Jim O'Neill was talking about that, that. Really, that is one really good way of stopping these bugs getting about. It's quite difficult, though, to persuade people to do it, even when they know they should be doing it. So it's, it's almost a, it's a problem for anthropologists rather from scientists to persuade people to behave to do things that they know they should be doing to stop these bugs getting about. But on the other hand, there are other bugs which are coming along. We've heard about uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. We're sort of holding, I suppose, stopping it getting a lot worse, but we haven't sorted that problem out uh, by any means. And that, of course, is a very, very unpleasant disease. And again, that's an international disease. Those bugs get around, people tr travel around the world. So. I'm moderately optimistic in the sense that we have won a few battles, we're holding the line on some other things, but there are many things we can be doing which, which will make things better, like controlling the use of antibiotics in farming, particularly giving an antibiotics to animals just because they grow a little bit faster when they're getting antibiotics. We're not giving it to them to stop them getting ill. We're giving it to them basically for commercial reasons. We have to clamp down on all that, and that's taking a long time because politics comes into that too, and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, even although I'm moderately optimistic, I think the Zika story shows that something can suddenly come out which we weren't expecting uh, to really cause major problems. And we have to be prepared for that. So it's not just a question of doing the things we know we should be doing, fighting antibiotic resistance, controlling the use of antibiotics, controlling the bugs by vaccination, but also be ready for unpleasant surprises. And, one can't predict what they will be by definition, but we know that they will happen. But as you say, small steps, cook your meat well and wash your hands. Hugh Pennington, thank you very much for talking to us. And you, Shelley Batra.
as well as Jim O'Neill, who joined us a little earlier at the start of the program. And thank you very much for watching. There's more online on our program site at aljazeera.com or our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join us on Twitter at AJ Inside Story. From me, Jane Dutton, and the whole team, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again very soon.